Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. My name is Danilo, and I'm part of the Evangelist team in Amazon Web Services. Uh, I work on this content with Shin Brizals from the Lego Group. Uh, unfortunately, Shin had a personal problem. He had to leave Vegas in a rush, so he's not with us today, and I'm presenting alone. Uh, I hope it will not be boring. Uh, uh, but the idea of this session is really to share the experience of Lego. Uh, and the idea is to start uh, to find uh, the, the sparkle, the way they found uh, a serverless could help them solve business problem and improve their architecture. And then to, see, to go through their journey, uh, we decided to go through a, a list of use cases that uh, they, they solved using serverless. And for each use case, we will show you a, a pattern that is quite generic and it can probably be applied to a similar problem uh, in your companies, in your application, in your architectures. And at the end, we will have a few takeaways from, this, from the session. So how it, it all started in, the, in Lego? So first of all, we're talking about the, the Lego e-commerce platform, the e-shop. Uh, and this website, where maybe some of you spend some money, uh, it's actually, uh, until a, a couple of years ago, it was designed as a, as a sort of a monolith, what we would call a monolith application. So the e-commerce platform uh, was an Oracle ATG uh, platform. Everything was on-premise. Uh, this Oracle ATG was calling an SAP uh, platform on-premise for lots of different things. So, uh, for uh, the product catalog, for uh, managing, managing order fulfillment, for the CRM, for the tax. And specifically for tax section, uh, there, there, was another on, on, there is another on-prem system that is this uh, tax system that they need to use for some batch jobs, but also they need to use it online for the, sale, for the online shop for the US and Canadian citizens to compute online the, 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 the tax of the products. And this platform uh, was on for a few years, they started some modernization projects. So they, when they start to use AWS, they added a VPC on AWS where they uh, removed the front end from the Oracle ITG product and created a, a, a more a modern React front end uh, for the web and a mobile app uh, uh, with a Node.js app running on Elastic Beanstalk uh, and using Oracle ITG as an API, API, via API as a backend API server. And then they also added uh, a third party uh, API gateway uh, to manage uh, authentication and authorization for the access to the backend APIs. And this was uh, uh, the modernized version of the, uh, of the architecture. It was going well. Then something happened during Black Friday 2017, so uh, a little bit more than two years ago. Uh, at some point, the on-prem tax system started to slow down and by slowing down, it was slowing down the requests that were coming from Oracle ITG that started to slow down, starting to slow down all the system that were calling uh, the, the backend, and then the tax system went down, and it brought down the SAP system, Oracle ITG, and in a matter literally of more seconds than minutes, uh, customers start to get the, the infamous 503 uh, error because the website was down. And they were down, unfortunately, for a couple of hours uh, to, to, uh, and then they recovered and everything and brought back the website. So this is probably not the best way to start a presentation, but actually when these uh, bad things happen, uh, it's the time where you can rethink what you're building. You, know? it's the, you take the opportunity to think and say, what, 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 why we made these mistakes? What, how can we improve? No? So in, they start to think and they came out with a series of architectural principles. And one of the principles was, if I have to call uh, a system like the taxation system, why have to go through other systems that I don't need? I, it's better to go direct, directly from the source to the, to the destination. Uh, so they started to rethink in the architecture, and then they also found out that the tax system was having an online version, a software as a service version of the same product. So they say maybe for the critical part we can use that too. So they came out with uh, a first evolution. And the problem for them was that they didn't want to invest engineering time on Oracle ATG because they already decided that Oracle ATG was to be replaced. So they wanted to avoid investing time in creating a custom integration between Oracle ATG and the external SaaS uh, tax system. Uh, at the time, Shin, uh, who's by, uh, Shin uh, from Lego Group is based in London, like me, 
Uh, he was uh, participating to the microservices uh, uh, meetup there, to the AWS user group, to the serverless meetup, and he saw some customer using you know, serverless architecture with Lambda functions, API gateway, solving similar problems. So he decided maybe we can create a REST API using the API gateway and a Lambda function that in builds all the complexity of the integration, and then the Oracle ITG did just to call a REST API in a very simple way so that we minimize the impact. Uh, and in this way, we can create something uh, that is highly scalable because the scalability is managed by uh, the AWS serverless platform and by the external SaaS provider, and we have very little impact on the internal architecture. So normally when I say let's find the first use case for a serverless app in a new, app, in a new company, uh, I say start with something simple. And here the first Lambda function was actually integrating the, the uh, e-commerce platform with the tax system. So it, it's quite uh, a complex scenario. Uh, how can you go in production with, without experience with something like that? So they decided to use feature flags. So in the Oracle ATG implementation, they put a feature flag that they could use to control the deployment, and they can decide if the, to send users uh, to the new tax system or to the old path through SAP. In this way, they knew that they could roll back if something was not going as, accept, as expected with the new platform. So this was September 2018. Uh, and it was the first Lambda function that went in production uh, in the Lego group. Uh, uh, and uh, as you can see from the console, it's, you know, it's triggered by the API gateway. It's using, for example, system manager and the parameter store for managing para configurations and, and secrets. And it was the beginning of their, of their journey. And after a couple of months, from September to November, it was again Black Friday, and this, as you can expect since I'm here telling their story, this time everything went well. Uh, they had even more requests than before, uh, and uh, the new system was uh, capable of handling everything without any problem. So this created a lot of interest and visibility inside the company about this solution, uh, and they started a project to use more serverless, and just a few months later, so July of this year, uh, the full shop.lego.com website was switched to serverless on AWS. Uh, so a fully serverless uh, website. If you go there and you, if someone asks you, I want to test a serverless website, you can, you, can, you can bring them there. And during this part, they start to adopt more and more AWS services to solve their business problems. So they now use a quite huge portfolio of uh, services that we offer. And these are some statistics. Uh, they are even a little bit higher than this. They have more than 165 Lambda functions in production now, uh, 30 microservices. Uh, API gateways. What I like here, for example, is they don't have a lot of different S3 buckets, so they control the number of S3 buckets. This is something that S3 buckets can be really powerful. Sometimes you need to create a new one for any use case you need. And let's see what was the journey that brought them to this level of adoption. And as I said before, let's go through the use cases and the pattern that, that, they, saw, that they implemented. So the first use case is probably the first thing that comes into mind if you think of a retailer. Is putting something into a basket. Now you select a product and you put it into your shopping basket. So it, it's a relatively simple operation, uh, but still needs some integration. Uh, uh, this is not using the old Oracle ATG platform, but they, 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 they implemented this as they were migrating to the, a new e-commerce platform. And uh, the, the solution here is pretty straightforward. There is an API gateway that is configured to do a request response. And the API gateway is calling a Lambda function uh, in a synchronous way. Uh, so it's a synchronous invocation. The Lambda function is doing the final check uh, on, the, on, the, on the item. And then it's adding uh, the item using the, ba the basket data store that is provided by the new commerce platform that they, are, that they are implementing. It's very simple, but the reason that it's so simple is because these uh, operations that the Lambda function is implementing on the backend e-commerce are atomic. They either work or don't work. Uh, so this is a, a good use case for uh, this kind of scenarios. If you have uh, a Lambda function that is calling multiple systems and you can have partial failures, maybe one works, one doesn't work, and then you have to roll back the other one, then probably a Lambda function cannot be the, always the best solution. Maybe a step function workflow works better, especially with the new Express uh, workflow that we launched yesterday that are very uh, cost efficient and, uh, and can be used to model a, a business workflow in a nice way. 
So this is the, the, the first and basic use case. The second one is probably the opposite. So instead of a very fast API, like adding an item, sometimes you have operation that takes time, like the processing of an order. So in this case, uh, you normally create a synchronous uh, API. So you, you want to create an order, and the order takes time, needs to be validated, you need to check payment. And during this time, the customer needs to be able what is the state, to check what is the status of the order. So in this case, the pattern that they implemented is a CQRS with a status cache. So CQRS is one of the standard pattern in, a, in software and microservices, especially architectures, and it stands for Common Query uh, Responsibility Segregation. The idea is that for some kind of, a, of, of operation, you want to separate the commands, so the writes of your API, from the reads, uh, the queries of your APIs, and they have two different paths, because they are used in different ways. In this case, for example, the commands, they go through a, a post to a, a submit order API. Uh, this submit order API is calling uh, synchronously a, a submit order function. Uh, this function is doing the final check and then it's putting the order into a, an SQS queue. Uh, uh, and from this SQS queue is taken, this order is taken from a function that is uh, the couplet from the front end, so the front end already gets immediately the feedback for the customer, your order has been submitted, and it takes its time to do the processing, so it's check the payments, it uh, works with the newcomer's platform to process the order. Uh, during all these operations, this Lambda, the, the backend process order function is uh, keeping the status updated in a DynamoDB table. So in this case, they're using DynamoDB as a cache. It's a little bit of an abuse because DynamoDB is now replicated across multiple availability zones. Uh, but it works well because they use a DynamoDB with an on-demand configuration. So DynamoDB, DynamoDB scales automatically. They don't have to manage the, the throughput. And when they write the uh, order status, they add a, a time to leave, a TTL, to the items. And DynamoDB can fi configure to uh, respect this TTL. So will automatically delete order, the order status after some time when it's, uh, time the data gets old and it's not useful anymore, so it will automatically expire. And then there is the, the other part, so the query part of the CQRS pattern. This is an HTTP GET to uh, the API gateway uh, to check the status of the order. And to check the status of the order, there is this function that will uh, very quickly go on the DynamoDB table where it will find the updated status of the order and can provide the result back to the, to the, to the client. And this Lambda function is also doing something more interesting uh, because internally you have lots of visibility of the status of, a, of an e-commerce order. For example, if a payment fails on the credit card, you know everything that happens there. Uh, maybe it's, it was a wrong pin, maybe you reach your monthly limit. Sometimes, especially for security reasons, you don't want to show everything outside. So this Lambda function is decoupling the internal backend visibility on the order from the front-end visibility. So from the outside, you only see if the order is processing, uh, it has failed or it is complete. Uh, but internally, you know uh, exactly what is happening. So if it, if it has failed, you know if it has failed because there is some uh, order in the, in the, uh, error in the product or problem in the payments, what, what kind of uh, uh, problem in the payments, and so on. So this is a, a suggestion for you to be careful with the visibility on the outside and the visibility in the, on the inside in this kind of architecture. Architectures. Another very common use case for an uh, e-commerce platform, but I have to say it's something that we do as a AWS as well, is uh, voucher codes, or in our case, it would be AWS credits. So when you are a retailer, you want to create voucher codes, discounts, uh, that then are distributed uh, across lots of different channels. So sometimes you print them, you distribute them electronically or together with products. And these voucher codes, they require a certain level of security because at the end it's, it's money, it's a discount on a, on a product. So how can you build this in a serverless way, uh, in an efficient way? So they came out with a very simple solution that is using email notifications and uh, signed URLs. So in this case, the internal administrator user, if he wants to create some voucher codes, he can ask from one to one million voucher discount codes. It goes on a, to an API. Uh, this API is, uh, the, the API gateway is always synchronously calling the Lambda function. So there is this request handler that is calling asynchronously because this takes time. So you can't have someone, an API wait for uh, more than a few seconds. Uh, a generate voucher function. And uh, it's acknowledging back that this uh, request of creating the vouchers has been received. 
And then the generate voucher function will create the voucher codes, uh, store the voucher codes into a DynamoDB table that will be used as the uh, source of truth. So when a voucher code is used, you can check there each item that has been used. And it will also do a full backup of all the batch of requested, uh, of requested uh, voucher codes to an S3 uh, bucket, uh, where it's, it's stored as a file. Then it will generate an Amazon S3 sign URL. This is a URL that is signed with AWS, with AWS credentials, so you can use them externally. And we'll publish this sign URL on an SNS topic, a uh, notification topic, that is configured to create an email notification. And the administrator will receive the email notification containing this, uh, uh, this code, and uh, this sign URL, sorry, and clicking on this sign URL, it can download the, 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 the full batch of voucher codes and then, and then use them internally. Uh, and then DynamoDB remains as the source of truth for the use of the voucher. Uh, this is very simple. This architecture can, can actually be changed in a couple of ways. So, the, of course, the email notification from SNS is a completely bare bone email. So if you need something well formatted because maybe you want to send this to a partner, not internally, you can replace that with a Lambda function and a simple email service where you can choose your own formatting. And the other thing is a little bit more <laughs> internal. So the sign URL here is signed by the credentials of the Lambda function that is generating the voucher. And Lambda functions, they use a, a role. So those are temporary credentials that are generated by the uh, IIM AWS platform. And these credentials are automatically rotated after some time. When there is this rotation, anything that has been signed with the previous credentials uh, doesn't work anymore. So that means that even if you sign a URL and you tell to S ask to S3 to sign a URL for one week or for one month, uh, when IIM will rotate the role, the, the signed URL will expire immediately. So for them, it was okay because their use case is that immediately the administrator in a matter of minutes is downloading the file. But if you need a uh, longer time, uh, the, the solution is to create an IIM user with the, the minimum amount of permission to create the sign URL and then store the, the credential of this user, for example, on secret manager or on parameter store encrypted. And then the, the, the Lambda function will use this credential, assuming this credential for the sign operation. So this is maybe a little bit tricky, but at least you know that this is something that happened when uh, I was talking with customers and they were not expecting this behavior. Another, and now we have another use case in our list. Another, uh, Another uh, use case that I see very commonly with large enterprises is having more than one uh, identity system. So this happens because maybe you have a migration, you have legacy systems that are not using the latest, the latest uh, identity system, or after a merge and acquisition, you can have multiple identity systems. So in their case, it was the reward system. So they have a, 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 a Lego identity system that is the one that they use for authenticating on the website. And the rewards system that uh, they, they uh, created, they, they, they used to replace the old reward system as its own user IDs. Uh, and they want to build a way to bind the uh, Lego ID with the rewards ID. This is a classical example of identity integration. And they wanted to do it uh, in a very light, simple way. So their solution is this one. So in this case, the customer goes to the client application that can be a web or mobile app. The client application is authenticating with both the Lego ID and the e-commerce platform, and it gets uh, the Lego ID and the rewards ID. Uh, the problem is that these two credentials, uh, they can be both valid, but they can be from two different users. So what happens is that they want to call a profile API uh, and make requests to the rewards platform, but the rewards platform, can I trust this rewards ID? Is this really the, the, the right user for this rewards ID? Maybe I have two, a user with two different identities. So the solution here, and this is something that is a very nice trick, is to use a Lambda authorizer. So with the API gateway, you can use a Lambda function as authorizer, so it can check the payload of the request and can validate without authenticating and authorizing the user to call uh, the, the, the API. In this case, the authorizer is uh, checking if the session, so you get a, a, a token session from the two platforms, if the sessions are both valid, uh, and it checking on the commerce platform that actually the Lego ID of this uh, rewards user is the same. 
So if they are the same, it will authorize, and so the, the rewards platform can, sorry, uh, can trust this ID. So anytime you need to uh, integrate two uh, different identity systems, uh, a Lambda authorizer can do, can do the trick. So this can be used for a tactical migration, or you can even keep it for a long running for a, for a long time. Another thing that they, 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 they did is uh, managing, managing customer data migration in a quite smart way. So uh, as I said before, they changed the, the, the e-commerce platform from the old platform to the new platform. And normally when this happens, you take all the old customer data and you migrate to the new one. Problem is that you have old customers that are not active anymore, or sometimes you have a customer that create a new profile and don't use the old profile anymore because maybe the old email is not active anymore. Uh, they didn't want to migrate everything, but it's impossible to decide which is the right data and what is not. So they decided to do an on-demand customer data migration. So the flow is, is this one. So when a customer goes on the new website, the first time it will create a, a, a new profile, and this new commerce platform will notify uh, a system saying, hey, there is a, a new profile. This uh, process will check if the profile has data on the old SAP system. If there is data, it will fetch the data and update the profile transparently, so the user will find all the configuration that he left on the old system uh, without having to retype and recreate the, the, the profile. And building this in a serverless architecture is, is super easy because then the new commerce platform is posting on SNS topic the, the information and there is a new customer with this uh, email. Uh, the customer topic is uh, connected to a Lambda function that is triggered. The Lambda function is fetching the data if the uh, profile is found in the SAP system. And if this is, there is data, we'll update the, the, uh, with all the profile data the, the, the new commerce platform. This happens uh, almost in real time, very, it's very quick, so it happens with no impact on the user experience. Uh, and in this way, they only migrate profiles of active users. Uh, and if a user returns after some time, they still preserve the old database there so they can still fetch the data. And I think it's a, it's a smart way to avoid bringing very stale old data with you when you do a, mig you do a migration. And talking about uh, e-commerce and in general, when you have a product catalog, uh, product catalog is something always very complex to manage, and it's often probably one of the most underrated uh, part of a of a e-commerce architecture. Uh, normally, you, you over time you have a complex catalog with rules, discounts, uh, and this product catalog they get lots of updates. In their case, SAP is still the authority on the product catalog. Uh, it sends the products feeds continuously do, during the day with continuously with updates. Uh, and they need to apply this on the new e-commerce platform. And there is also the additional problem that the, the, the product feeds were generated uh, by the old integration, so they use the syntax of the old e-commerce platform, and they don't want to change the SAP integration because it's complex, so they want to create a feeds transformation that will transform the, date, the feed to the new format. So how can you build this uh, in a serverless way? So in this case, SAP is writing the data feeds as files on an S3 bucket, and this is a very simple integration. So if you have a legacy system and you need to build an integration with AWS and you can work with files write, written on S3, it's always one of the simplest way of doing the integration. So these files are continuously written on S3. This triggers a Lambda function uh, that will trans uh, transform uh, the, 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 this, this, this uh, these records, and this happens thousands of uh, times per day, so it's something that is continuously happen, and they want to do this very quickly. As soon as a new file is there, they want to process it. But then they need to apply the changes on, on the e-commerce platform, and they want to control that uh, in the tail. So for this reason, they write the transform feed into an SQS queue so that they can control uh, the messages. And then uh, an S, uh, a Lambda function is taking the, 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 trans, the transformed feed from the SQS queue and is applying the changes on the, on the new platform. But here they have fine control because they can control, for example, uh, if they want to stop a feed, they can just disconnect the Lambda function from the SQS queue and then they stop the updates for some time if something they want to control. They can control uh, also, uh, they, they connected this SQS queue also with a DL queue, a dead letter queue. Uh, so SQS has this capacity that you can tell if a, if a message remains in the queue for more than a specific amount of time because 
it's impossible to consume this message. Every time you try, probably you get an error and the message remains in the queue, is not deleted. Uh, after some time, you can send it to a, or the SQS can send it to a, a dead letter queue where you can process it. In their case, they send a feed to the monitoring platform so that they can understand which uh, product uh, updates can't be applied. Uh, and in this way, they can also control errors on the, on the product feeds. And so they have control on speed, they have control on, on errors. And this is actually not so simple as in this graph because there's not a single feed, but there are lots of multiple feeds. For, for example, you have product updates, you have pricing updates. And for example, pricing updates, they have top priority, so they are always applied as soon as possible. Other updates are controlled, and they have fine control on the, on the queues here to, to give priority to, to, to the update that, that they want to go fast and forward. When you work with serverless, one thing that you notice is that you need less code to build and the same business logic. But still, code is still a, a liability. This is something that uh, there's lots of discussions. Uh, the more code you create, the more code you have to maintain, you have to keep secure, you have to update. So can we uh, uh, create less code, uh, even less code with serverless? So let's see an example uh, from, from the Lego group. So they were building this architecture. So they wanted to get all the uh, uh, feeds of events from the client application. So this is the mobile and web app. And they wanted to collect uh, events that describe the, and, and can help them understand how the user are using their, their, uh, their website. So they want to do a data ingestion of these events into a store where they, they can process this data. And in this case, the, the API between the client and the backend is is something that is exposed to the front end that they wanted to have tight control on this API because it's an API that, uh, that it's used by, by the front end developer that is a different team. So the first architecture that you can build is this one. So the client is sending, the, the event producer is sending the data to an API gateway. Uh, the API gateway is calling a Lambda function that will uh, take this message and send the message, in this case, into a, uh, using the Kinesis platform. So in Kinesis, there is one service that is Kinesis data file host that you can use to store data on S3, on Redshift, on Elasticsearch. There are other integrations. And it's also quite smart. It's smart because it can do buffering. So you can tell to data file host, uh, as you receive these records, wait to receive a certain amount of data, like one megabyte, 10 megabyte, or that some amount of time has passed, like uh, one minute or five minutes. After you reach either the limit on time or the limit on size, write this file on S3. And this is efficient because instead of writing lots and lots of small events on a street that it would be very difficult to process, they're writing large files with every, every few minutes. Uh, and then when the file is on S3, you can have a processing application. But if we look at this function here, do we really need this function? This function is taking data from the API gateway and passing the data to Kinesis. It's just moving data. And one tip that I give you is every time you have a Lambda function, it is just moving data. It's not applying any business logic. Probably there's a better way to, to create a flow that will remove that Lambda function. And, in, and that's what they did. They actually just removed the Lambda function and they used the native integration of uh, API gateway with, uh, with Kinesis. Uh, you can create a configuration that will automatically call Kinesis with the, the parameters that you want. And they have less code to maintain, less compute cost, uh, and everything is fully managed and scalable because there's not even a Lambda function that needs to run. Uh, to consume the, 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 the file on S3, they also implemented an interesting pattern that, I, again, is quite common. It is the fun out pattern. So uh, imagine that you have this large file that contains lots of events that are coming from uh, in a certain period of time. Uh, they have this fun out function that is just passing through all the events, is uh, grouping the events per category, and then for each category of events, it's passing the, the same category to a, uh, a, a lambda function uh, asynchronously that is processing only a specific uh, type of events. In this way, they can create smaller function that only process a specific type of event, and they receive only a specific, uh, the, the specific type that they're capable of. And everything happens asynchronously and in parallel, so it's fast to process, and it's much easier to, uh, to control. And 
this is also now even more efficient with the new Lambda destinations that we launched last week. So you, uh, with, for asynchronous functions, now you can control what happens in case of failure or, or error. So you, you, you can receive the notification if one of these asynchronous invocation is not working, you can process that and understand what was happening. This is the architecture they have in production, but still sometimes you, you may have the requirement of checking the, to validate if the, the record in the Kinesis stream are correct or you want to transform the records to a standard format because maybe you have different sources. So as an option, Kinesis uh, Data Firehose accepts a Lambda function that is doing exactly that. So you can have a Lambda function that is uh, validating and transforming all records. Uh, uh, if the record is, for example, invalid, you can write the record in an errors bucket. Uh, and if you do transformation, Kinesis has an option to enable at, at data stream level, you can say, uh, in case of transformation, do a full backup of the source into this backup uh, S3 bucket. In this way, if something goes wrong, you can still find the source records there uh, that are backed up by the system itself. It's not the logic of the Lambda function to do so. Uh, this is a, a codeless approach. Uh, Shin would call it function, functionless. Uh, and he also wrote an article on the Lego engineering blog. So if you want to see more information on how to set up a similar architecture, this, this article uh, on the Lego engineering blog, uh, Shin goes into details of how, uh, wh what are the advantages. Also, some we already covered. One thing that struck me was that uh, every Lambda function needs some sort of permissions to do what is done. The, the every Lambda function has a role. So in this case, you also re reduce the number of security permission that you have to manage. Also, the security is, is easier uh, by reducing the number of functions. So this is a codeless data ingestion. Let's see another interesting uh, codeless use case from, from the Lego group. Uh, if someone here used to work with the old nice uh, monolithic architecture, you remember that it was very easy in the past to create ordered sequences. Uh, yes, often you just would go on the database and say create sequence and then you can create a, a sequence of, uh, and you can use this sequence for example for order IDs uh, or for customer IDs for anything that needs something unique. In distributed systems often you see this replaced by UUIDs, so very long strings to manage. But in this case Lego they wanted to do something different. They wanted to create a service that can generate unique sequences for other services. So in a microservice architecture, each microservice can call this service to generate their own sequence. And actually, they built this without any code, and they use this architecture. So any microservice can call the API gateway uh, the, for a sequence number API. The API gateway can do the authentication, validation, and then can directly call DynamoDB without any Lambda function in the middle. And in, the, in DynamoDB, the, it goes into a specific table where there is an item, and this item has an attribute that is a number that can be incremented atomically by DynamoDB and returned to the client. So this is completely managed, no code. Uh, the only limit of this architecture is that since uh, e uh, each sequence is using a single DynamoDB item, so it can only use the full throughput of a single dy DynamoDB partition, so it can't scale without limits, but you have the limit of the throughput of a single data, DynamoDB par partition. This normally is not a problem because normally sequences, you don't call them multiple times per second. It's something that you call when you need to create an order ID, for example. So it's, it's normally okay. And this is the syntax that you use. So when you, the, the API gateway is calling the update item uh, API on DynamoDB, is giving a table name. So for example, the table sequences, then in this table, you can have multiple items. Each item can, do a, can create a different sequence. So for example, going by key, you can have an item that is, that is called order, where for an order ID. And then you use the update expression to update uh, uh, an attribute, num in this case, adding one or whatever expression you want. You can add one, decrement one, or whatever number. And this update expression is managed by DynamoDB. It is designed to be atomic. So even if you have concurrent updates, you don't have to manage that. Uh, the, the update is managed in an atomic way, and you always get uh, the correct increment by this call. The, long, the last thing that you need to do to have a, 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 an API that returns the new value, DynamoDB can return the old and the new value in case of an update. In this case, you only want the new updated uh, value, so you have to specify that you only want the updated new. And then you receive the updated value. You call DynamoDB, and you can create a sequence. So this is another interesting 
uh, example of codeless architecture. And uh, again, Sheen from Lego is quite keen in entering into more details. So if you want, there is this nice article that he published on the Lego engineering blog where he goes into the details of how to set up uh, this uh, functionless uh, uh, sequence generator. As I said before, in July, the Lego migrated the shop to serverless. Uh, and uh, just a, a few days after, uh, uh, and a month after, they integrated the shop uh, website with the uh, standard Lego website to create a, a, a more integrated experience for the customer going on, the, on their website. Uh, and this was, of course, better for customers, but there was a side effect. Since they created a new website, this was changing the URL. And since the URL are different, customer can come from with an old URL and you need to send them to the correct content. So how can you uh, do that? You need to have a source of truth that in their case was the, 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 the content management system uh, that helps some business logic to identify the right destination and send the customer to the right destination. And again, they solve this with a serverless architecture. So they build a URL redirect system that is cached by the, the, the content delivery network that they use. So the customer comes through the content delivery network. Uh, the first time, if the, if not, the, the URL is not cached, uh, it goes to a, a, an application load balancer that calls a Lambda function. Uh, this is not an API, so they didn't use the API gateway, they used the ALB. Uh, this is normally uh, a little bit easier and it's also uh, slightly cheaper if you go with high volumes than the, the API gateway. Uh, today we launched the new uh, HTTP API, so I didn't do the comparison now, so it may be different, but this is uh, definitely an option. If you don't need uh, an API, but you're building a web server, it's probably better than, 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 than the full uh, API gateway, definitely. So the function, what it does on the first invocation is getting the URL rules from the content store, and then based on the rules is re returning, for example, a 301 uh, per move permanently to the client that tells this is the new URL. This, the, the 301 are cached by the CDN, so this invocation happens once, and then all the next invocation will be handled in an in easy way. Downloading the rules is, uh, of course, not very efficient to do every time, so they, they cache the result. Uh, any, any Lambda function has a slash TMP uh, that is completely free to use. It, uh, it's 500, uh, and, and, and they store the result there. So, the first invocation is a little bit slower than the other. This is a dump from the CloudWatch logs. But the next invocations are very fast. Uh, this is something that now you can uh, improve with the provision concurrency that we launched again yesterday. Uh, some of you maybe read the blog post that I wrote. Nobody? OK. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the provision concurrency allows you to tell to, the, to Lambda to pre-provision a certain number of concurrent environments. Uh, uh, and it prepares these environments for the first invocation. So to use provision concurrency efficiently, you need to download the URL files, in this case, before you reach the first invocation. So in the initialization code of your Lambda function. If you do a lazy download, so you wait for the first invocation to do the download, provision concurrency would not help uh, in this case, so, uh, or would help with a, in a limited way. So don't do lazy load with Lambda use the initialization code of your function to do everything heavy so that when you reach the invocation, you're ready to serve them quickly. As I said before, every Lambda function has 512 uh, megabyte of storage that you can use. This is uh, for each concurrent environment, so you can't share data, uh, but it's empty when we create the environment, so it, the good side is if you find something there, you put it, so it's very, uh, using it as a cache is uh, probably one of the standard use cases. Uh, depending on the configuration of the function, you also have more memory than storage. So say you, if you increase the memory of a function to have more CPU power and you don't use all the memory, of course using the memory can be another option. Another uh, interesting use case is, uh, and this very tight, this one is, uh, when you change URL and you have a very dynamic website with different products like Lego, uh, you need to keep all the search engines updated because you want always to send people to the right URL. 
So what large websites do is to create sitemaps. Sitemaps are large XML files that are advertised to the uh, search engine. So the search engine can consume these XML files and understand exactly where every product, every item, every uh, uh, specific topic of your website can be found and doesn't need to discover that by itself. And sitemaps needs to be updated uh, periodically and published to the search engine. So they created an interesting serverless architecture here. So a single Lambda function was too complex here. So they used a stack function workflow uh, and they need to run this periodically. So they use a CloudWatch event uh, to run this daily. Uh, the trigger rule will call directly a step, uh, the step function to start uh, a state machine execution. Uh, and, and then they run the business logic to create the sitemap, and they use S3 uh, both as intermediary storage and also at the end to publish uh, the, the, the content as the origin of their CDN. So the first part, is S3 is private, the second part is public. And this is a zoom on the, on the workflow. So the, they use two parallel branch to generate the different sitemaps that they need. Uh, they have two different views of their website. You can go through products or you can go through categories. So they generate the two sitemaps. Uh, they are written on a temporary S3 bucket. Then they merge these two results and then they publish on a release bucket that is uh, on, uh, the origin of the CDN so that is advertised to the uh, search engines. Uh, in this case, they only have two parallel branches. Uh, uh, talking with Shin, they have a similar use case where they also have to take into account the localization. So they have to do this for different locales. So the number of, of, uh, of parallel branches is dynamic because they continuously add new locales. Uh, in that case, they use the new uh, dynamic parallel uh, feature of a step function that was launched, I think, in September. So now you, you, you can create a, uh, an arbitrary number of parallel branch depending on the size of the JSON array that you give in input to the state. So this is a way for them to scale in parallel and then uh, uh, aggregate all the results and publish the results. And the final use case is probably uh, the most interesting to me. Uh, uh, we started with the creation of the order, putting the item in the, the, in the basket and then checking the order status. And the final step is managing the checkout. The checkout of an e-commerce platform is always one of the most complex, complex processes. Uh, you have lots of different uh, components, microservices in this architecture that needs to talk with each other and you need to integrate them. So at first, uh, they did that using lots of SNS topic. So each topic was advertising a different topic, a different kind of information. But this was growing uh, a lot and it was difficult to manage. So the idea was, okay, let's replace all these topics with uh, a, an event bus uh, that can route the events based on rules. And they were actually thinking about that. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of this presentation, I said on July the 10th, the 10th they, uh, they moved the website uh, to serverless. And the day after, uh, Shin was with me at serverless days uh, uh, London. Uh, and it, this, on the same day, there was the summit in New York, and we introduced Amazon Event Bridge. And Event Bridge was exactly what it was waiting. So I was sitting close to Shin, and Shin was saying, "Oh, this is exactly what I need." And this is the pattern that they implemented. Uh, this is the only one that is a work in progress; it's not fully in production because they are migrating uh, microservices one by one by opportunity. So some of these are already on Event Bridge, and some are still on the old SNS topic architecture. But the idea is to use event bridge to route this event. So for example, if the commerce platform sends the event that there is a new customer, if you remember one of the use case was to uh, check if the customer was a, an old customer in the old system and update the information. So this event is routed to the data sync uh, microservice here that will do that, the, this check. If, for example, uh, the payment is successful, this is routed to the order that will change the status of the order, that will send the event to the shipping, that will start the shipping of the product. So everything is routed in this way. And at the center, there is the event bridge rules. And event bridge rules, they can process the event. And event in a event bridge are uh, using a JSON syntax uh, like this. Uh, the, the part on the top that you see here is uh, standardized by AWS. So every event that Event Bridge is publishing can be an AWS event, 
can be your custom event, like in the case of Lego, can be an event coming from a software as a service platform like Zendesk that is sending you updates on trouble tickets. At the beginning, you will have uh, the source, the account, the time, the region. Uh, you will have also the detail type that normally is a very important information because the detail type is telling you what is the kind of information. This is a state change notification. And then there is a detail part. And the detail part is where we as AWS give complete freedom to the customer. So you can put whatever information you want inside the detail. So the idea that Lego has, and I think it's very smart, is to split the detail in two parts, a, meta, a metadata part and a data part. So the metadata is standardized inside Lego so that all the uh, services use the same syntax. So they have a type, a subtype, a status, a site ID. In this way, you can create rules that expect this information in the event. And then there is a data part that is uh, customizable by each microservice. So each microservice can use their own payloads. In this way, they can create rules that check if there is an event that is an order. And if the order is complete, then you can route it to this service. If the order is not complete or there is an error, route it to these other microservices. And I think it's very smart to have these three levels of standardization, the AWS part, the customer part, and then the service specific part. By the way, uh, yesterday, that was a day crowded with announcement, we also launched the uh, uh, event registry for event bridge. So now you can uh, store uh, the syntax of your events into a, a registry where you can do discoveries. So an application can go there and discover which is the format of another microservices. So it's very dynamic. Uh, and you can also uh, download the, the starting code for uh, Java, Python, and TypeScript so that you have the starting code to process this event. This is especially useful for strongly typed languages like Java and, uh, and TypeScript because you, you have the old syntax to process the, the event. Uh, and this works also with software as a service partner. So if you consume events from a partner, you can receive the syntax through the registry and it's much, much more efficient. So this is completing the list of, of, the, of the patterns and, and, the, and the journey that uh, Lego wanted to share with you. Uh, what are the, the, the takeaways of, the, of these slides? Uh, I hope that these patterns are pretty generic. So there, there's so many different use cases, you can find some ideas for, uh, for, uh, for your, your application. Uh, there are some concepts that go a little beyond the, the simple use cases. So first of all, uh, how can I start? The example that uh, Lego gave is pretty strange to me. You know? Lots of customers, they start with a simple API. They started with an integration between uh, e-commerce and tax system. I think it's still through this rule. So look for something simple to begin with. Uh, but simple doesn't mean that it's not important. So in this case, the integration that they did was very simple, API Gateway and Lambda function. Uh, it was uh, very well controlled the deployment of the solution because they use feature flags, so they could, they could control, enable the new solution and roll back immediately. So if you have full control on the deployment and the solution is simple, you can start with something more important than what you normally do. The second learning that uh, Lego wanted to share is about integration tests. In a world like this, in a distributed world with microservices, integra integration tests are really important and should be automated so that every time you do a change, everything is checked again. Uh, they tried to mock AWS services at the beginning, uh, but it was just consuming time. So my suggestion is use the fact that you can create multiple accounts on AWS easily. You can even use uh, AWS organizations to control that in a more structured way. So create one or more dev account, one or more test account, and one or more produ production account. Uh, you can have a single production account, but you can there's also value sometimes in having different production accounts. Uh, and use one of the test accounts to run all your automated integration tests with real AWS services, S3, DynamoDB, Kinesis. Uh, the cost is really, is really low if you use them for tests, so it's probably the, the, the best option. It takes a little bit of time at the beginning to set up the environment, but then you will gain lots of advantage by the automating, by automating test. This is very close to, to Sheen, architect in set pieces. Uh, so set, this idea of set pieces comes from the English football, soccer on, the, on this side of the pond. Uh, 
Uh, and the idea is that there are some actions that you want to play and exercise before doing the match. And then during the match, since you did a lot of exercise, you can do that, this complex action easily. Uh, it's also similar to the way you build uh, Lego models, physical Lego models. So if you build the Millennium Falcon, uh, you don't build the Millennium Falcon from the first brick to the last brick, but you start creating something that you recognize, then you build another piece that you recognize. Then when you have lots of parts, then you start to join the parts together. Think in the same way when you build a complex architecture. Think of uh, simple patterns like the one that we saw and apply them. For example, the uh, event streaming uh, uh, architecture that uh, Shin built to process the product catalog that we saw before. It started as a single idea and then they replicated the same idea in multiple ways for the different product streams and for similar use cases. So this is the kind of set pieces that you can put into your own portfolio and reuse inside your company. Another idea that I really like is that when you build a proof of concept with serverless, you have to think about security because you still have to give security to the Lambda function. You have to you have lots of scalability that is automatically created by the serverless functions and components that you use. So the result of a proof of concept, if it's approved, uh, it doesn't need to be thrown away, but you can use it as a starting point to go in production. Bringing an idea in production is much easier. Uh, this is very important for startups, but I think it's also very important for larger companies because uh, innovating and being fast is the critical point today. So you don't need to throw away your POC if you build them serverless. They're really the starting point to build the final solution in production. And of course, uh, if you had the patience of arriving to the end of this presentation, leverage patterns. So there's so much that customer did on serverless. I shared the story of Lego here at reInvent. There are other customers sharing their serverless stories. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, find what other customers did because that's the best inspiration to, uh, to move forward in production. Uh, there's also lots of learning opportunities here at reInvent. Uh, there's also the online training website. And please complete the session survey on the mobile app. I hope my single alone delivery was not too boring. Uh, it has been more, and thank you. <laughs>